Today's topic is reflection and transmission. And we could add at normal incidents, meaning that we're going to be looking at play, plane waves striking a planar interface such that the, the pointing vector is parallel to the surface normal. So let's set up our description of our medium here. So here's Z axis and this is the X, Y plane. And we assume that for Z less than zero, we have electromagnetic parameters, constitutive parameters, mu one and epsilon one. And for Z greater than zero, we have mu two and epsilon two. And of course, then that would give us propagation uh, phase constant beta one is omega root mu one epsilon one and an impedance eta one is root mu one over epsilon one whereas for z greater than zero we would have beta two is omega root mu two epsilon two and eta two is root mu two over epsilon two <clears throat> so that's a description of our medium and let's draw this in perspective now. Here's the X and Y axes, and then into the board is the Z axis. And we'll assume that we have an incident field with electric field E incident, magnetic field H incident, and propagating in the Z direction. So here's your pointing vector p incident and that will be this is the incident field e incident polarized in the x direction linearly polarized amplitude e0 and propagates as e to the minus j beta 1 z and the corresponding h would be in the y direction and have an amplitude E0 over eta1 and the same propagation factor. Then we'll assume over here in the second medium, Z greater than zero, we've got another field. We'll call the transmitted field. That's propagating along the Z axis also, so this will be transmitted. And that has an electric field, which is polarized in the X direction. I'm gonna write the amplitude as a dimensionless constant times the amplitude of the incident field. We'll call this tau E0. Tau, we're gonna call the transmission coefficient. And that propagates in medium two, so it's e to the minus j beta two z. The corresponding magnetic field is in the y direction and has amplitude tau e zero over eta two and the same phase factor e to the minus j beta two z. Now let's think about the uh, Boundary conditions. Those are going to be at the boundaries at Z is equal to zero, where these two media come together. Well, the boundary conditions are that the tangential component of the electric field, which we're taking to be in the X direction, so the EX, and the tangential component of the magnetic field, which we're taking to be in the Y direction, so that'd be HY, these have to be continuous across the boundary. So let's see if we can meet those boundary conditions with these two fields. Let's see, so for the electric field, we would have E0 on the left, and on the right, we'd have tau E0. 
And we could certainly satisfy that if tau is equal to 1. For the magnetic field on the left, we've got E0 over eta 1. And on the right, we've got tau E0 over eta 2. And since we already took, had to take tau is equal to 1, now you've got the numerators are equal, E0, E0, so the denominators must be equal. So that would mean that eta 1 is equal to eta 2. So if the impedances are equal, then we can have just these two fields, and they will be have the identical amplitude of the electric and magnetic um, fields at z is equal to 0. Now, what is that condition? Eta 1 is equal to eta 2. That means these two expressions are equal. Now, that certainly would be trivially true if the two media were the same, but they don't necessarily have to be the same. As long as the ratio of permeability to permittivity is the same on both sides, this will be a solution. We'll get this plane wave that propagates and then just goes through this surface and keeps on propagating with the same relative amplitude of the electric and magnetic field. But in general, the propagation phase factor would change. We'd go from beta 1 to beta 2. So the ratio of mu 1 and epsilon 1 is equal to the ratio of mu 2 and epsilon 2, but the products don't have to be the same. So that's kind of an interesting situation. It's possible to have different materials as long as their ratio of permeability to permittivity are the same, you won't uh, have any other waves than these two waves, just incident and transmitted. But of course, that's not generally true. Generally, eta 1 is not equal to eta 2. So we can't match these boundary conditions with these two waves. So to get a match, we have to assume that there's another field. We'll call it the reflected field. And we'll write this here. We'll assume that the uh, electric field is here, still polarized in the x direction. And it's going to be propagating in the opposite direction along the minus e axis. And therefore, the magnetic field must be pointing in the minus y direction, because this plane wave has been turned around. Imagine this one rotated 180 degrees around the x axis. So that field is going to look like, we'll write it this way, E reflected is A hat x, and we'll write the amplitude as a constant rho, which we call the reflection coefficient, times the incident amplitude. It's propagating in the minus z direction, so this phase factor becomes e to the plus j beta 1z. And for the magnetic field, it's in the minus y direction. And the amplitude would be rho e0 over a to 1, same phase factor. Okay. So, box this as a special case. And now we'll look at this more general case. And what, what do our boundary conditions become now? Let's see. So on the left, we've got total electric field is the sum of the incident and reflected. That's E0 plus rho E0. So now we'll have E0 on the left will be equal to, oh, I'm sorry. No, E0 plus rho E0. So E0, 1 plus rho, will be equal to uh, the total field on the right is just the transmitted field. That's tau E0. Tau is the transmission coefficient. Rho is the reflection coefficient. And for the magnetic field, let's see. Uh, for z less than 0 over here, you've got A incident plus A reflected. Now, they're in opposite directions. So that would be E0 over A to 1 minus rho E0 over A to 1. So E0 over A to 1 minus rho times that. Okay? So that's the total magnetic field for z less than 0 at the boundary. And for the transmitted field, well, we just have tau E0 over A to 2.
So now with these equations, we can cancel the common E0 everywhere, and we get 1 plus rho is equal to tau. And then down here, we get, let's multiply both sides by a to 1. So we get 1 minus rho is tau times a to 1 over a to 2, right? So we multiply by a to 1, that puts the a to 1 up here, a to 1 over a to 2. So there are two equations in two unknowns. If we add those together, 1 plus rho plus 1 minus rho, we get 2. And on the right, we get tau times 1 plus a to 1 over a to 2. So that means that tau would be equal to 2 over 1 plus a to 1 over a to 2. And let's multiply top and bottom by a to 2. We get then 2 a to 2 over, I'll write it as, uh, and then the denominator becomes a to 2 plus a to 1. So that is your flexion coefficient. And then what is the, oh, I'm sorry, that's the transmission coefficient. What is the reflection coefficient? Well, then rho from this equation here is, is tau minus 1. Let's see, and so let's write that as tau is 2 a to 2 over a to 2 plus a to 1 minus 1, and we'll write 1 as a to 2 plus a to 1 over a to 2 plus a to 1. And that is all over a common denominator of a to 2 plus a to 1. Let's see. 2 a to 2 minus a to 2 is just a to 2, and then we've got minus a to 1. So we get a to 2 minus a to 1. So to summarize, the reflection coefficient is a to 2 minus a to 1 over a to 2 plus a to 1. And the transmission coefficient tau is 2 a to 2 over a to 2 plus a to 1, which is also from up here, um, 1 plus rho. So those are our reflection and transmission coefficients for an interface, a planar interface between two media. And nothing we've done so far um, keeps us from having any of these parameters being complex. So it could be lossless or lossy materials, and these would still work. Now, if they're lossy, of course, we know that the, the beta and the eta become generally complex. And that would mean then that the reflection and transmission coefficients would be complex. And that complexity of those would mean that there would be phase factors introduced by those parameters. Whereas if they're lossless materials, so eta 1 and eta 2 are, are real, then rho and tau are real. They may, may be positive, uh, or in the case of rho, it might be negative if eta 1 is bigger than eta 2, but they won't be complex. All right, let's just recap here. Incident field, AX hat, E0, E to the minus J, beta 1Z. Magnetic field, AY hat, E0 over A to 1, same phase factor. Transmitted field, well, let's put the reflected field first, actually. Reflected field, AX hat, rho, E0, E to the plus J, beta 1, Z. And magnetic field, minus AY hat, rho, E0, over eta 1, E to the plus, J, beta 1, Z. And then the transmitted field. AX hat tau E0, E to the minus J, beta 2Z, and the magnetic field AY hat tau E0 over eta 2, E to the minus J, 
beta 2z, where rho is the difference of the impedances over the sum, and tau is twice the second impedance over the sum. Now, let's assume we have lossless media. Both of the materials are lossless. That means the, the, the etas and the betas are, are all real. And let's look at the pointing vectors. So for the incident field, let's see a x hat cross a y hat is a z hat. Right, and we have one half, the real part of e times uh, cross uh, h conjugate. So we'll get uh, the magnitude of e0 squared from this times the conjugate of that. And then over the conjugate of eta one, but eta one's real. So the real part of that, well, that's completely real. So that's what the pointing vector is. How about for the reflected field? So the reflected field, similar um, calculation, except now the H component is in the opposite direction. This is propagating in the minus Z direction. All right, so a hat x cross minus a y hat is minus a z hat. We'll have one half. The real part of this times the conjugate of that. So that will be rho squared because lossless media, the eta's are real and rho will be real, times the magnitude of E0 squared, allowing that E0 might have a phase term, might be complex. And then over a to one, which is real. And then for the transmitted field, a hat x cross a hat y is a z hat. We'll have a factor of a half. This times the conjugate of that, that'll be tau squared magnitude e zero squared over a to two. So those would be the pointing vectors, the intensity of the field in the direction of propagation. So since this is lossless uh, media, the sum of the incident and reflected fields uh, plus the transmitted field, they have to satisfy some conservation of energy. So we've got this incident field coming in, and we can think of then the reflected and transmitted fields going out. And so we should have that one half the magnitude E0 squared over eta one should be equal to the sum of these powers. So going out here, we've got one half rho squared magnitude E zero squared over eta one plus the power going out in the transmitted field, which would be one half tau squared magnitude E zero squared over eta two. And uh, we can cancel one halves everywhere and the E zero squared. <clears throat> and we get the following. Uh, let's see, and then if we multiply through by eta 1, we'll get that 1 is equal to rho squared eta 1 over eta 1 plus tau squared eta 1 over eta 2. So that's a relation between the squares of the reflection and transmission coefficients. Um, if you have lossless media. Now let's look at a special case. That's an important uh, special case. Let's assume that um, over here in for z less than zero, we've got mu one epsilon one and they're real. But for z greater than zero, we've got mu zero and the epsilon is complex. So we've got epsilon prime minus j epsilon double prime. And remember that um, omega epsilon double prime is your effective conductivity. So we could think of this as a conducting material, certainly a lossy material. We want to look at what the effects of reflection and transmission 
are in this case. And we'll assume the good conductor limit that we talked about in a previous lecture. And that is that epsilon double prime is much bigger than epsilon prime, the very lossy material. In that case, eta 2, which would be the square root of mu 0 over epsilon prime minus j epsilon double prime, is approximately, we, in the denominator, we just neglect the epsilon prime relative to the minus j epsilon double prime. And you can write that as the square root of j times the square root of mu zero over epsilon double prime. Okay. So again, that's all under the assumption that epsilon double prime is much bigger than epsilon prime. And how about the propagation, uh, the phase factor um, beta two? That becomes complex. It becomes beta minus j alpha, where in the good conductor limit, we show that alpha is about equal to beta, is about equal to omega root mu zero epsilon double prime over the square root of two. Something to note up here, we've got a square root of j, and just for reference, the square root of j can be written as one plus j over the square root of two, which you can just verify by multiplying things through. Okay, so what are the uh, reflection and transmission coefficients in this case? So the reflection coefficient would be eta two, so it'd be square root of j root mu zero over epsilon double prime, minus eta one, which is as before, is square root of mu one over epsilon one, over the sum of those. Now let's see what happens as epsilon double prime goes to infinity, as this becomes a perfect conductor. Well, this denominator goes to infinity, so this term goes to zero, that goes to zero, and then we're just left with minus eta one over plus eta one. So this goes to, goes to minus one, well, let's put it this way, as epsilon double prime goes to infinity. So the reflection coefficient of a perfect electric conductor is minus one. And what does that cause to happen? Remember that the, uh, the incident electric field is E0 and the reflected electric field is rho E0. So if rho is minus one, the incident and reflected electric fields are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction, they cancel out. So that kind of makes sense. This is a perfect electrical conductor. It shorts out the electric field. How about tau, the reflection coefficient? So let's put in the formula for tau. Well, it's two times the a to two, which is approximately two times square root j root mu zero over epsilon double prime, and then over this same denominator, square root j root mu zero over epsilon double prime plus a to one. And what happens to this as epsilon double prime goes to infinity, the denominator approaches eta one and the numerator goes to zero. So this goes to zero as epsilon double prime goes to infinity. So those are the PEC limits, perfect electrical conductor. The limit of the PEC, we get rho is minus one, tau is zero. And therefore, all power is reflected. The amplitude of the reflected field, it's the negative of the amplitude of the incident field, but the pointing vector, right, is going to be, have a row squared in it. And that means that you're going to have the same amount of incident power as reflected power, no transmitted power, and no power is lost. 100%
incident power is reflected. Now, what about if it's not quite a PEC, epsilon double prime is not infinite, but it's very big. We're still in the good conductor limit. Well, let's see. So let's take a look at uh, these formulas we have here. So if we call this guy X, and this is just eta, let's look at the uh, Taylor series for X minus eta over X plus eta, when X is very small, because epsilon double prime is really big. So the Taylor series for that, it can work out, is minus one plus two X over eta and then higher order terms. And then for the tau, well, this is going to be like, this would be like two times X over X plus eta, two X over X plus eta. And the Taylor series for that is X goes to zero is two X over eta plus higher order terms. All right, so this would be like your row and this is your tau. And remember that um, tau is equal to one plus rho. And you can see that if you take one plus rho, that's minus one plus one cancels out, you get two x over eta, which is equal to tau. So that that makes sense. So let's uh, then use those approximations. So Here's your row, and that will be approximately minus one plus two x over eta. So that would be plus two root j um, root mu zero over epsilon double prime over eta one, which is minus one plus two root j. Let's see, eta one is the square root, well, let's put this over here, the square root of mu one over epsilon one. So that would be the same as multiplying by the square root of epsilon one over mu one. So this becomes in the square root of mu zero epsilon one over mu one epsilon double prime. That's your row approximation. And tau is approximately, well, it's approximately just this, this factor right there because that's the 2x over eta. So it's approximately 2 square root j root u0 epsilon 1 over mu1 epsilon double prime. Now, what we want to look at is the conduction current in medium two. There's going to be an electric field over here, and so there's going to be some sort of current density, J. And remember that the propagation, uh, the phase factor beta two becomes beta minus J alpha. So in the conductor, J, which is equal to sigma times the electric field. What's the electric field? Well, it's tau. It's in the x direction. Tau is the, the transmission coefficient times the amplitude of the incident field. Let's call that EI for now. And then it propagates as e to the minus alpha z, e to the minus j beta z. And that is approximately equal then using our results. See sigma, the effective sigma is omega epsilon double prime. And our tau is two square root, that's up here, this is expression here, j square root mu zero epsilon one over mu one epsilon double prime. Amplitude of the incident field e to the minus alpha z, e to the minus j beta z. Okay, so that's your conduction current. 
Now, let's take a look at uh, the limit of that. At z is equal to 0, these factors go to 1. e to the minus 0 is just 1. What can we say about the magnitude of j? What does it go to as epsilon double prime goes to infinity? Well, here's an epsilon double prime. Here's a square root of epsilon double prime in the denominator. That would leave a square root of epsilon double prime, and that would go to infinity. So j goes to infinity as epsilon double prime goes to infinity. So the current density right at the surface at j is equal to 0 goes to infinity. What about at positive values of z? Well, let's see what, what are the basic terms. Here you're going to, as we said before, you're going to get an epsilon double prime over square root of that. So you're going to get overall factor of epsilon double prime square root. And then this is just a phase factor, so it doesn't change the amplitude. Uh, and you're going to get e to the minus alpha z. e to the minus, and what is alpha? Omega root mu zero epsilon double prime over the square root of 2. So that's going to be something that goes as, as far as in terms of, the, of epsilon double prime, it varies as the square root of epsilon double prime. So you're going to get, it's going to look like the square root of epsilon double prime times z and some other factors. What happens in that case as epsilon double prime goes to infinity? Now that goes to zero. Why? Because um, x, and we can write e to the minus something as e to the 1 over e to the plus something, and let's just say x over e to the x roughly, that is going to go to zero as x goes to infinity because the exponential grows exponentially faster than the linear function x. So we get this very interesting behavior. In the limit of the PEC, where epsilon double prime goes to infinity, the current density is infinite at the surface and zero away from the surface. So this starts to look like kind of delta function behavior. Something that's infinite at one point and zero everywhere else kind of sounds like a delta function. So let's try to quantify this a little better. So let's define the surface current density as js of x, y is equal to the limit as epsilon double prime goes to infinity, that's the PEC limit, of the integral from 0 to infinity of j of x, y, and z dz. Okay, so we've got over here in the electrical conductor, this thing is dropping off as e to the minus alpha, alpha z. And so we've got this current density defined throughout this medium. And we're going to define an equivalent surface current density right here at the surface, which is just the integral at that point x and y. We're just going to integrate all the way from z is 0 to infinity. Now, in the limit we approach a PEC, as we said, the current gets all squished up onto the surface, becomes infinite, current density becomes infinite on the surface, and zero everywhere inside the material. So in this, uh, this limit, this, is gonna, this thing should kind of go like a, a delta function, and then this limit should be some finite value we expect. So let's see how that works. By the way, J has units of amps per square meter. And since we're then integrating, this has dz would have units of amps. This surface current density would have units of amps per meter. We cancel one of the meters because of this dz term.
So we're going to be integrating uh, an e to the minus alpha z and also a, a beta term there. Let's look at an identity, the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus gamma z tz. You can do that integral quite simply. It's one over gamma. And therefore, using that, the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus alpha z e to the minus j beta z dz is, well, just combine these and make your gamma alpha plus j beta. So then this becomes 1 over alpha plus j beta. And that's the only z dependence in the, in the uh, current density. And so therefore, that takes care of the, the integration. And so therefore, using our previous results, js is the limit as epsilon double prime goes to infinity of, we've got our sigma, which is omega epsilon double prime. And our tau is two square root of j root mu zero epsilon one over mu one epsilon double prime. Uh, it's in the x direction. We've got the incident electric field and then we've got this one over alpha plus j beta. And so that's one over one plus j with the one for the alpha and the j for the beta because remember alpha is equal to beta in the good conductor limit. And then alpha and beta are equal to omega root mu zero epsilon double prime over the square root of two. Let's see, I wanted to close that right there. Okay, so what is that gonna, what's the limit gonna be of that? Let's take a look at the, where the epsilon double prime is. Here's a factor of epsilon double prime. And here in the denominator is an ep, square root of epsilon double prime. And here in this denominator is another square root of epsilon double prime. So we can see that those are gonna cancel out. You've got two square roots in the denominator that make one, makes one factor of epsilon double prime that cancels the epsilon double prime in the numerator. And now let's see what's left. Here we've got a, uh, a mu zero, square root of mu zero here in the denominator. There's one in the numerator, so those cancel. And now what's this? Square root of epsilon one over mu one. Well, that's one over the square root of mu1 over epsilon1, which would be, so this guy here becomes then 1 over eta1. Here's a 2 square root of j. Remember, square root of j can be written as 1 plus j over the square root of 2. And so altogether, what this leaves then is that your js is equal to, it's polarized in the x direction, um, two times the amplitude of the incident electric field over eta one, because right, this guy cancels that. You bring up, this brings a one over one over square root of two brings a square root of two up. And so, because this term here is one plus J over the square root of two, that square root of two cancels that one. It leaves you a two uh, and this one plus j cancels that one plus j, and so then this is this is your result that the surface current density, right, which is an infinite volume uh, current density, uh, so it all collapses to the surface and has a has a magnitude two times the incident field strength over eta one, and it's in the x direction. Now there's another way to write this. Since the, uh, the incident magnetic field is in the y direction and has amplitude of E incident over eta 1, E to the minus J beta 1 Z, we can also write at, right, be at Z is equal to 0 at the surface, we can also write that the surface current density has the form of minus 
2 az hat cross a incident. Why is that? Minus az cross ay is ax. Uh, the 2 here gives you that 2. You've got the e incident and the over e1 from that guy. And of course, at z is equal to 0, this, this term goes away. Moreover, since uh, in the limiting case of a PEC, rho is equal to 1, the, the reflected magnetic field is equal to the incident magnetic field at z is equal to 0 because the, the uh, incident and reflected electric fields are opposite. So the magnetic fields are equal. And so the total magnetic field, which equals the incident plus the reflected, will be twice the incident. And therefore, we can finally write this in a fairly useful form that JS is equal to. So 2H incident will just be the total magnetic field. And let's see. Here is the conductor. And this is the z direction. And its surface normal, the outward pointing surface normal, is minus a hat z. So we can rewrite this as the surface normal cross the total magnetic field. And that's a very useful formula. That is at the surface of a PEC material, perfect electrical conductor. Now let's think about the power that's lost. When you have a field that's incident and then it re is reflected, it will take amplitude of one for the incident, rho for the reflected, tau for the transmitted. And you've got this conduction current in here. And so it's a good conductor, but not a perfect conductor. Right, we know that in the limit of a perfect conductor, Rho is minus 1, and so the incident pointing vector is equal and opposite to the reflected pointing vector. All the incident power gets reflected. No power is lost. But what about if it's a good conductor but not a perfect conductor? Well, in this case, right, the uh, incident pointing vector will be 1 half magnitude e0 squared over a to 1 and we'll assume that we're assuming that a to 1 over here is real that this is a lossless material on the left and the reflected pointing vector is in the minus az hat direction and it just has a factor of magnitude of rho squared times magnitude e0 squared over 2 eta 1. Magnitude of rho squared, because now in general rho will be complex. So we got rho times rho conjugate when we take our pointing vector. And so what is the total power lost? Right? Remember, this has units of watts per square meter, or watts per unit area. So what's the total power loss per unit area? It would be the magnitude of the incident pointing vector minus the magnitude of the reflected pointing vector. So that would be, let's see, they both have a common magnitude e0 squared over 2 eta 1. And then this will be 1 minus the magnitude of rho squared. But what is the magnitude of rho squared? Well, what's rho in the good conductor limit? We saw that it was minus 1 plus 2 root j root mu0 epsilon 1 over mu1 epsilon double prime. That's approximate, but a good approximation for a good conductor. Okay, and we want to take the, uh, the absolute value of this. And let's see, so what is the magnitude squared of this expression here? So this has a form of minus 1 plus z, where z is some complex number. So minus 1 plus z 
the magnitude squared, well, that would be minus 1 plus z times minus 1 plus z conjugate. A number times its conjugate is its magnitude squared. And that would be, let's see, minus 1 times minus 1 is equal to 1. And then here we'd have minus z minus z conjugate. So minus z plus z conjugate. And then z times z conjugate so would be plus magnitude of z squared. And remember, rho uh, here is very close to minus 1. So this number here is very small because epsilon double prime is really big. So we're going to neglect that and say that this is about equal to 1 minus, and the complex number plus its conjugate is 2 times its real part. So this is 2 times the real part of z. So what does this become? So... power per area lost then would be equal to this magnitude e of uh, e zero squared over two eta one here we'll have uh, one minus this magnitude of rho squared but that has a one in it so one minus one is zero and then minus minus two real part of x so that'll just be two times the real part of this expression here. 2 root j root mu 0 epsilon 1 over mu 1 epsilon double prime. And let's see, remember that square root of j is 1 plus j over root 2. And therefore, when you take the real part of that, well, that's just going to give you the 1 over the square root of 2, and the j part's going to go away. So we're going to have 1 over square root of 2. Here's a 2, so that'll give you square root of 2, and these 2's cancel. So all together, then, you're going to get, this is going to be equal to, there's going to be a factor of square root of 2. We just said magnitude e0 squared over, let's see, here's an a to 1. But let's see, here you've got a root epsilon 1 over mu 1, right? That's 1 over a to 1. If we p pull out that square root epsilon 1 over mu 1, that gives you another 1 over a to 1. So there are two factors of those. So it's be a to 1 squared. And then that leaves here root mu 0 over epsilon double prime. So that's the power lost per unit area. Now we're going to define something called the surface resistance by equating this to one half a surface resistance times the magnitude squared of the surface current density. And remember that the surface current density, we uh, calculated that, and it's that's two e zero over a to 1, so we'd have the magnitude squared of that, and this is real, real, if he's, well, let's actually, E0 might be complex, so let's do magnitude squared. And so what is that going to give us? Let's see, we're going to have here, 2 squared is going to give us a 4, and then an over 2 leaves us a 2, and we're going to get the magnitude E0 squared, and A to 1 is real, so magnitude of that squared is just A to 1 squared. And therefore, and then there's also then our, our RS here. And so we can now divide out this, that term there, and that cancels there, and that then defines our RS for us. We divide by 2, and that square root of 2 over 2 gives us a 1 over the square root of 2, and we finally get a definition of our surface resistance as mu0 over to epsilon double prime square root of all that. We call that the surface resistance. What can we do with that? Well, in this case, what we, we showed is that P dissipated per area, surface area, 
is equal to one half that RS times the magnitude of the surface current density squared. And so what this is telling us is that if we know the surface current uh, density and we have the surface resistance, we can calculate then the power loss per unit area. And we can apply that to other situations than just a plane wave incident on a, an infinite conducting plane. We could, if we later on, when we, for example, look at waveguides, and here the, this is a good good conductor. What we'll do is we'll solve this for the PEC case. All right, so this where this goes to a PEC. We'll solve that. We'll get the current density using our previous formula that it's the surface normal cross the total magnetic field at the surface. And then to account for losses, we'll calculate for the good conductor but not PEC case what the surface resistance is. We'll assume that the magnetic fields are essentially stay the same. And we'll calculate this formula and then we can get the total power per uh, unit surface area lost in that waveguide. So we've seen that the reflection coefficient is eta 2 minus eta 1 over eta 2 plus eta 1 when we have an interface between two media with impedances eta 1 and eta 2. This could be called the forward uh, or direct problem. That is the problem where we have a complete description of the electromagnetic properties of a system and then we know some incident field and we calculate the all the scattered fields and in this case those scattered fields would be the reflected and transmitted fields. But there's also what's called the inverse problem and that would be Say we knew that this was eta 1, but over here, eta 2, we didn't know what it was. It's some unknown material. And we measure the reflection coefficient. And from that, we hope that we can figure out what eta 2 is. That's called the inverse problem. And a lot of uh, very important problems in applications are inverse type of problems. So let's see. So let's start with this expression here. Let's uh, rewrite this then as eta 2 plus eta 1 times rho equals eta 2 minus eta 1. We want to collect the, uh, we just multiplied through by this denominator here. We want to collect the eta 2 terms, eta 2, and let's uh, move this over to the other side. So we'll have eta 2 times 1, and then we'll subtract rho and then move the terms without an eta 2 the eta 1 terms over to the other side so that'll be 1 times eta 1 plus rho times eta 1 so that'll be equal to eta 1 1 plus rho and then from that we can say that eta 2 is equal to eta 1 1 plus rho over 1 minus rho so if we know eta 1 and we measure rho, then we can figure out what eta 2 is. And of course, eta 2 would be root mu 2 over epsilon 2. If we know it's a non-magnetic material, so if we know that mu 2 is equal to mu 0, then we have just, we can determine what epsilon 2 is. We can figure out the permittivity or the dielectric constant of this second material. And so that's called the inverse problem. Very, very important in a lot of applications. Now let's extend our results to where instead of just two media, we've got three media. So 
Again, here's the xy plane, z is equal to zero. Over here, we've got mu1 epsilon 1. And over here, for large values of z, we've got mu3 epsilon 3. And in between, between z is equal to zero and z is equal to w, we've got a material with mu2 and epsilon 2. So now we've got three media. And we imagine we have an incident field coming in. There's going to be some reflected field. And over here in medium 3, there's going to be some transmitted field. How do we figure these out? How do we solve this problem? All right, we're going to assume we have the same types of incident and reflected fields as before, as in the, the two media case, AX hat e0, e to the minus j, beta 1, z, and h incident is a y hat, e0 over eta 1, e to the minus j, beta 1, z, and that we have reflected fields of the same form as before, so reflection coefficient rho, oops, and these are propagating in the minus c direction, so it's e to the j plus j beta 1 z. And h reflected is in the minus a y hat direction, rho e0 over a to 1 e to the plus j beta 1 z. And then over in medium 3, we've got the transmitted fields. tau times e0 e to the minus j beta 3, right? So beta 3 now would be omega root u3 epsilon 3. And of course, eta 3 would be the square root of mu3 over epsilon 3. And we're going to write this phase factor as e to the minus j beta 3 z minus W, so that right at this boundary, where we're going to have to impose boundary conditions, this phase factor becomes just 1. Uh, and the H transmitted is in the Y direction, tau E0 over eta 3, and the same propagation factor. Great, but what about in medium 2? So there's where it gets a little bit tricky. So here's that z is equal to 0 and z is equal to w. We will assume that there can be two fields in here. One we'll call um, Ea, and that's propagating to the right, and another we'll call EB, and that's propagating to the left. So we'll write in the second material, we have EA, which is AX hat. We'll write its amplitude as little a E0, so proportional to the incident field. And that's going to be propagating um, to the... Uh, to the right, so that'll be e to the minus j um, beta 2 z, and the h corresponding to that will be a y hat a e0 over a to 2 e to the minus j beta 2 z. And then the EB, which is propagating to the left, will write EB will be AX hat B times E0, and it's propagating to the left, so it's E to the plus J beta 2 Z. And HB will be, because this one's propagating to the left, just like with the reflected field, the... Uh, 
there's a minus sign uh, for the uh, magnetic field. So you get minus a y hat b e zero over a to two e to the plus j beta two z. So we've got two new field components here in this this little window. We can think of this as a dielectric window. And now we're going to have two boundary conditions. We're going to uh, have to impose boundary conditions that z is equal to zero and z is equal to w. And each of those boundary conditions actually is two equations, one in the electric field, one in the magnetic field. So we're going to get four equations, and we've got four unknowns, rho, tau, and now a and b. So, After lots of algebra, which we go through in step-by-step -step detail in the PDF notes, we end up finally solving for rho and tau. You can just follow through all of that, uh, all of that algebra, which is not too illuminating to just rewrite here. And we end up with this result, that the reflection coefficient is rho 1, 2 plus rho 2, 3, e to the minus j, 2 beta 2 w, over 1, plus rho 1, 2, rho 2, 3, e to the minus j, 2 beta 2 w, where we define rho 1, 2 to be a to 2 minus a to 1 over a to 2 plus a to 1. It is the reflection coefficient between media 1 and media 2 if those were both semi-infinite. And likewise, rho 2, 3 is a to 3 minus a to 2 over a to 3 plus a to 2. That would be the reflection coefficient between media 2 and media 3 if they were both semi-infinite. And beta 2 is omega root mu2 two epsilon 2. So that's the reflection coefficient. And if you want the transmission coefficient, you get that tau is equal to e to the minus j beta 2 w 1 plus a to 2 over a to 1 over 1 plus a to 2 over a to 3 times 1 minus rho 1 2 that's this expression here times the reflection coefficient rho so if you calculate rho then you can put that in here and you can calculate tau so more complicated expressions but uh, here's the closed form solution for the reflection coefficient now an interesting question then all right, so this is for this general case here, arbitrary width for the second material, arbitrary mu's and epsilons in all cases. An interesting question is to say, okay, we just, we just worked out that if this is medium one, this is medium two, and this is medium three, this is a width w, we figured out some reflection coefficient rho for this composite system. What would be the equivalent if we call this one and this is some effective single semi-infinite media what would be the impedance eta effective of that that would give you the same reflection coefficient so if we in other words if we replace medium three with this layer or window of medium two by a single semi-infinite material what would the impedance of that have to be to give you the same reflection coefficient? We call that the effective impedance. Uh, impedance, sorry, impedance. No, impedance, the effective impedance. Um, and again, lots of algebra, which is all in the PDF notes. And we find this expression, eta effective, is equal to eta 2, that's the impedance of this window here times eta 3 cosine beta 2w plus j 
eta 2 sine beta 2 w over eta 2 cosine beta 2 w plus j eta 3 sine beta 2 w. Okay, so, if I've got three materials, I can replace materials two and three by a single material, such that if it has this impedance, I'll get the same reflection coefficient as I did in this more complicated problem. And now you can apply that concept to even more layers. Suppose we have, here is z is equal to zero. Here is z is equal to w1 and z is equal to w1 plus w2. So this is a width of w1, this is a width of w2. Over here you've got, suppose it's free space, mu zero, epsilon zero. Here's mu one, epsilon one. Here's mu two, epsilon two, and here's mu three, epsilon three. And we wanna find the reflection coefficient of this composite structure. Well, we know if we have a semi-infinite medium covered by a window of some width, we can figure out an effective impedance for that structure. So so right at that point, we'll get, we'll call this an effective prime, which would be eta two, the expression we had before, eta three, cosine beta two, w two is the width of this window, plus j, eta two sine, beta two w two, over eta two, cosine, beta two w two, plus j, eta three, sine, beta two, w two. Okay, so we calculate that. And now, for the purposes of reflection, we can replace those two media. Here's, we've got, uh, let's just write the impedances, eta zero, here's eta one, and now medium two and three, we, we replace by this n effective prime, and this guy has a width of w one, and now we can calculate eta effective for this entire structure, let's put it down here. What would eta effective be? Well, in this case, eta effective would be eta one, the impedance of this window, and then the second material has impedance eta effective, so that would be uh, eta effective prime, rather, cosine beta one w one plus j eta one sine beta one w one over and then we just swap the uh, the eta's there plus j eta effective prime sine beta one w one and you could continue on as many times as you want. So you could have arbitrary numbers of layers. Right? Maybe here is a eta zero, eta one, eta two, dot, 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 dot. And maybe here's eta sub n. So you can take the last two materials and get an effective impedance. And then Take that effective impedance and the next layer, n minus one, and so on. And just keep adding a layer and getting a new effective impedance until eventually you get an n effective, say zero, for the entire structure. 
So the concept of uh, effective impedance can be very powerful for analyzing very complicated multi-layered reflection problems.